now we are taking a closer look at the Middle East, which remains a geopolitical powder keg. And Gaza Strip itself is at the epicenter. So our top story is the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. And let's face it, this is not an, a game of monopoly. We are talking about real life and real consequences. And now my guest to discuss this issue is Maurice Hirsch, Advocate um, Director of the Initiative for Accountability and Reform of the Palestinian Authority in the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Hi, good morning. So, could you perhaps share an overview um, on the current situation in the Gaza Strip? I am especially talking about the humanitarian situation. So, what we have at the moment with the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip is very, very clear. We have Israel providing hundreds of trucks every day going into the Gaza Strip, whether via Israeli territory via Israeli crossings that have been rebuilt and rehabilitated at Israel's expense after the terrorists destroyed them on the 7th of October. And really, not a small amount of, 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 of humanitarian aid moving in also from the south, from Egypt. People tend to forget that Gaza has an entire border with Egypt um, and that the Egyptians have closed that border entirely, never letting even one refugee uh, escape from the Gaza Strip. We then now have this added um, element of the floating port that has been set up, um, which is meant to provide more, hundreds more tons of humanitarian aid to um, the, the Gazans. Now, the problem with this whole effort is that at the moment, this entire effort is coordinated by Hamas, by the genocidal terrorists who are taking control of the aid and then handing it out, thereby facilitating and maintaining their control over the Gazan people without really caring for their well-being, but using the aid as a means of control. Right, you in fact already foreshadowed my next question because I wanted to ask, we, because we do see that now the vast majority of humanitarian aid goes to waste because of it is being distributed by Hamas that is actually making people pay for the humanitarian aid that they would receive for free normally in normal circumstances. So do you see, I know it might be an absurd question, but do you see any possible solution to that terrible um, situation that we are seeing in the Gaza Strip, humanitarily speaking? So yes, I do believe that there are many things that can be done. I think that one of the, 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 the major aspects that needs to be taken into account and dealt with pretty much immediately is ensuring that there is no involvement of the UN organizations, organizations like UNRWA that have been thoroughly penetrated and infiltrated by the terrorists, whether it be from Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, these people are not interested in humanitarian aid. They're interested in using and abusing the international community to forward their propaganda efforts and to show that there is a humanitarian crisis, but only because they themselves are causing uh, this crisis. And so I think that the way that the world needs to go now is to move away from this paradigm of, of UN organizations in coordination, in cooperation with the terrorist organizations they the ones giving out the aid and really take control independently, even if it means that Israel needs to take control of that situation and set up its own distribution points in the Gaza Strip. Um, and now taking perhaps uh, a cl closer look at the broader spectrum, I am talking about now um, the US that recently approved military aid to, to Israel, uh, the, let's say a new package of aid. So could you perhaps elaborate on, on the specific or at least how crucial is this support? Well, so I think it has to be understood that the, the, the aid coming to Israel, the military aid coming to Israel, is not necessarily only here for Israel. Yes, it helps us in the short term, but this is a war of civilizations. This is not a war of Israel only against Hamas. This is a war against the Iranian Islamic fundamentalist access that is penetrating every single walk of life. I was watching the reports previously um, of, of the Pope's blessing for Easter, and, and, I, and I fear that we're somewhat missing the idea that part of this onslaught now around the world is this Iranian-backed fundamentalist terrorism, which is striking in Gaza. It's, it's really undermining Lebanon entirely. As the, as, the, as the Holy Pope said, there is 
conflict on the southern uh, um, border of Lebanon caused by Hezbollah, caused by Iran. This elephant in the room needs to be called out, this destabilizing really aspect of wars around the world, wars on Christianity, wars on Judaism that is being led, run by the mullahs in Tehran. I'm really glad that you mentioned it because that's that's um, <clears throat> that's true that we are forgetting, or at least many analysts um, forget that we are not only talking about Hamas itself, but we are talking about also other Islamic organizations, namely uh, Hezbollah, for instance, that now Israel has to. Um, get braced itself also from for the threat coming from from Hezbollah itself so my question is do you think that even if um now Israel managed to to defeat the terrorist organization of Hamas do you think that now uh well the let's say the pot will be still stirred because of the situation with Hezbollah without question I think that Hezbollah has got itself into a situation and is dragging Lebanon into a war that I don't think Lebanon really wants. Lebanon is looking out what Israel is doing in, in the Gaza Strip against the terrorists there and is understanding that a war would be potentially disastrous. But Hezbollah isn't interested in standing down, not because Hassan Nasrallah has any type of reasonable thought process, but rather because he is simply doing the bidding of the mullahs in Tehran. This is the guiding force that we have to look for in all of these actions, in all of this terrorism, in all of this uncertainty and on all of this violence, is who's pushing this violence around the world. And there we see Iran, there we see often, and in many cases, quietly funding, using their outside, uh, outsized influence. We see Qatar as well, influencing, paying for, and buying really uncertainty and, and, and distrust and, and, and violence around the world. And having a closer look at, like you mentioned, Qatar or Iran that are secretly or silently now financing and using their own funds to, to finance these terrorist organizations, in your expert opinion, how, what role can international organizations play in mitigating the crisis that we are facing? But I think that the, 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 the really very much like an alcoholic that, that, that before he can be uh, um, cured of his disease needs to first admit that he has a problem. And I think that the first step for international organizations, for the countries around the world, is to first admit that we have a problem. This problem is the Iranian-backed terrorism, the Qatari-backed terrorism, the Turkish-backed terrorism. And this Muslim Brotherhood uh, um, spreading around the world and undermining and destabilizing countries. That's part of what we need to see, identify, and then we can work out a plan as to how we fight back. But while we still continue on with this old trope of, well, it's Israel's fault for fighting against the, the, the terrorists, then I, then I fear that we're not going to get anywhere, definitely not within the, 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 the UN which is so completely dominated by this false paradigm, by this false narrative of Palestinian victimhood and Israeli aggression, so-called, when really the opposite is true. It's the violence, the terrorism coming out of these organizations that are undermining um, uh, international peace efforts. But do we see as of now any diplomatic efforts that are underway and are able to de-escalate de these tensions or is it just um let's say everything is very surface level so i don't, I, I i can't say that i've been a, a party to to any real substantial diplomatic discussions that are, are are taking place on this level i think pretty much everyone understands that hamas is a genocidal terrorist organization that rejects israel's very right to exist they've said oh that they will carry out the october 7 massacre over and over and over again, that they don't care about the lives of the Palestinians. So there isn't really much to discuss with these people. They just need to be eradicated. The same is true with Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah. This is an organization that really we have no beef with Lebanon. We have no fight with Lebanon. We are not interested in a war with Lebanon. And yet these terrorist organizations have been firing over 4,000 rockets already at Israel's north. Um, 
unprovoked in any way, shape or form. And, and so how do you then have a diplomatic conversation with people who are just involved in genocidal terrorism because they deny your very right to exist? We cannot, we cannot hold a, a, a discussion with people who, who, who want to see us all dead. Um, and, and so that is, I think, one of the fundamental aspects that is really weighing down on this effort to even come up with a diplomatic solution that these people deny our right to exist. It's a, it's a very important point that is there any talk, can there be any talk about democracy if the other party does not believe in democracy at all? Well, thank you so much, Maurice Hish, for joining us and sharing your insights into the situation. Thank you very much for having me.